right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having an incredible week. Got a fun show for you guys. We're going to be hitting Suns Mavs from last night. Super interesting game. Going to talk a lot about the new additions for the Mavericks and how they're helping them. So I've had that game circled on the calendar for a while because it's our first opportunity to see the Mavs against a quality opponent post trade deadline. Uh, after that, we're going to go into the Boston Celtics and the Chicago Bulls. Big win for the Celtics pulled away in the early second half in that one. I also wanted to clarify some of my thoughts because I've had some pushback from Celtics fans surrounding the kind of dynamic between their paint attack and how much they post up. And I want to kind of dive into that uh, a little bit. After that, at the end of the show, there was a, a debate that went around, I think, on Wednesday last week or this week, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, involving kind of J.J. Redick and the state of modern sports media. And I had some thoughts on that front because it's been a super fascinating thing to me as I've been trying to build this show out. As Obviously, I'm very new into this industry and I've been learning a lot about it. And I just had some thoughts on that front. So we're going to save that for the end of the show. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel. It'd mean a lot to me if you guys would take a second to hit that subscribe button. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. Also, it's helpful if you leave a rating and review on the podcast front. I would appreciate that. Uh, follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss the film threads that I do from time to time in the mornings as well as show announcements. And then last but not least, keep dropping mailbag questions in the YouTube comments. We're going to have a couple mailbags over the course of the next week or so. All right, let's talk some basketball. So like I said, had this game circled on the calendar for a while. The Mavs had won six games in a row, but they had played a couple of injury riddled teams. I think it was the Sixers and the Knicks, and then they had played a bunch of bad teams. And also, uh, uh, they had a big, massive win against the Oklahoma City Thunder, but P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford did not play in that game. So I wanted to kind of like get a feel for the the Mavs against a really good opponent. Now, here's the thing. Uh, the Suns didn't have Bradley Beal, but even without Bradley Beal, they're still a really good basketball team. I think Royce O'Neal has kind of added to their physical profile on the perimeter and given them a better option there. Royce actually had a, a bunch of contested rebounds last night where even though he didn't shoot particularly well in that game, I was watching him and I'm like, this is something that's going to be important for them when they get to the postseason, like a, a a wing player that is a plus offensive player, but that also is going to like win some physical battles for them. And so again, like I, I love that pickup and in general, even without Bradley Beal, I still think the Suns are a really good team and they controlled the game early. Devin Booker came out and he was red hot. You could tell he was just hunting his shot, stepped into like a pretty contested transition three on the right wing in the early possessions. And you could just tell like he was gunning for it. Uh, as a team, they shot eight for 17 from three in the first half. Dallas wasn't super sharp defensively in that half, uh, particularly in their pick and roll coverages. They were giving away some easy swing swings for uh, catch and shoot threes on the perimeter. Kyrie was incredible in the first half for Dallas to keep them in it. He had his three ball going. He had that kind of like tough transition three going. It's a footwork thing that I work on with the high school kids that I train too. Like whenever you're shooting a movement shot, you want to try to get the end result to be up and down, uh, which is all about leg strength. And if you watch Kyrie on those shots, like he's sprinting up the floor at full speed, but he gets that left, right footwork down and he goes pretty much straight up and down. There's a little bit of a forward movement, but it's pretty balanced on that shot. A lot of, a lot of people don't realize that, but that movement shooting, that pull-up shooting, almost all of that comes down to leg strength. It's like your base is one of the most important parts of that type of shooting. But uh, it was close game, 63-60, I think, at halftime. And then Luca just utterly assassinated them to start the third quarter. Got crazy hot from three. Hit a uh, catch-and-shoot three on the right wing, then he hit a couple of pull-up threes. He actually hit one off a sidestep to his right, which I don't think I've ever seen Luca do before. Like, Luca. Uh, when you when you shoot as a right-handed player moving towards your right, you kind of have to square up in midair. Uh, like uh, JJ Redick has done a bit about this on his show, I think with Cam Johnson uh, from the Nets about like the idea of squaring up as a right-handed shooter moving towards your right, and that's more of an athletic play, right? And Luca's a little bit more of a ground-bound shooter. That's why like so many of his post-up fadeaways are spinning over his right shoulder so his feet are kind of more naturally square or step back is usually stepping back to his left with his right shoulder already in position to take that shot and so it's kind of interesting just to see Luca kind of demonstrate that he's got that in his bag too it just goes to show you how good he was feeling in this particular game they built a quick lead they did lose it for a second Luca got a little carried away and started attacking Kevin Durant in ISO which uh, kind of cooled him off and like again that's the last guy on Phoenix that you want to attack in ISO, especially for a guy like Luca, because KD just has the length to kind of bother him on those shots. 
As a result, uh, uh, the Suns made some shots on the other end. Royce O'Neal hit a three on the left wing, got it to 81-80. But Dallas regained control pretty quick from there. Good team effort when Luka was off the floor at that point. Daniel Gafford was super active. He generated two extra possessions just being active on the offensive glass. There was one where he kind of caused a loose ball crashing on the baseline side and forced Royce O'Neal to, like, go out of bounds to save the basketball. And then Josh Green made a nice athletic play, swiping in from the weak side wing to get that steal. Led to a Kyrie Irving catch and shoot three. That put them back up by four. Then Kyrie actually uh, drew a foul after that to get to the foul line. KD started attacking Maxi Kleba in uh, uh, in ISO, and Maxi was holding up super well, which became a theme even as we get into the fourth quarter. We're going to talk more about Maxi and a lot of the Dallas defensive personnel here in a little bit. Daniel Gafford had a big block and help side defense. I also thought Tim Hardaway Jr. had some good stretches on defense against Devin Booker, just getting late contests as he was coming over the top of ball screens, and then some good driving kick possessions. He had a driving kick to a corner three on the right side, and then he also had a kind of transition driving late up where he hit a bank shot. A good team effort, beautiful basketball on both ends. Dallas kind of regains control. But we go into the fourth quarter, and it's a five-point game. And then the Mavs close it out with efforts on both ends of the floor. They start with a Luka post-up on the right block. On that possession, KD zones up and comes over on the opposite side of the block to help. And Maxi just slipped right in front of the rim. Luka hit him. He had a layup. After that, um, uh, KD tries to ISO Maxi Kleba again, and he gets another stop. In ISO. After that, uh, they push in transition. PJ Washington catches on the right wing, rips through to the left, gets a left handed layup, and it's a nine point game. So, pretty quickly, Dallas regains control. There was a cool sequence at the end that I wanted to, to hit on uh, as it pertains to Phoenix's offense, which we'll talk about here in a second. So, after uh, KD hits a tough turnaround jumper in the lane, then Luca drives on Grayson Allen, draws a foul. Still a nine point game. It's 102 to 93. So, at that point, there's an open double of Kevin Durant on the perimeter. Dallas sends two defenders, no ball screen or anything. They just send Maxi Kleb over to just double team Kevin Durant on the perimeter. And there was this really interesting possession where, you know, Nasir Little and Josh Okoji are running around trying to find an opening. Grayson Allen's just like standing in the left corner. Might as well have had his hands in his pockets. He's not doing anything. Royce O'Neal's kind of floating around the perimeter and they can't find a way to beat a blatant on-ball double team. And it ends up leading... To a uh, uh, to a Josh Okoji turnover, and that's when Kyrie Irving got the ball and had that ridiculous sequence where he did like the behind the back dribble that then spun, uh, went into that nasty spin move and went right up at the rim and laid it up, and they were up by eleven. And from there, the Mavs basically stiff armed them and won by double figures. But I thought it was super interesting on a couple of different levels. One, Dallas's defensive rotations, which we're going to get to in just a second, and then two, Phoenix's offense when Bradley Beal is not on the floor and how they can struggle, especially in fourth quarters, to deal with double teams and traps and stuff like that. That has become a consistent theme throughout the end of the season. And I, I thought that was just kind of like a, uh, an interesting play sequence in that game that kind of demonstrated both teams and some consistent themes that we've seen in the past for Phoenix and what I expect in the future for Dallas. Excellent defensive rotations and backline athleticism for Dallas or spacing principles and a kind of like a Mendoza line of, of offensive talent that Phoenix can dip below when Bradley Beal's not out there. That makes it easy to double team the ball out of their stars hands. So I want to start with Dallas's defense. Let's get there first. They have the number one defense in the league over this seven game winning streak. Now there's a lot of bad teams in there. Like I said, I don't think Dallas is actually a number one quality defense, but they absolutely look like a team that can reach a level defensively. That is good enough to give them a chance to make a run in the playoffs. And so let's get into why I want to start at the point of attack. I thought PJ Washington did a really good job on Kevin Durant kept beating him to spots chesting him up and taking that contact. And then he uses outside hand to swipe down and disrupt the shooting pocket. And, you know, he also just has the length to be a nuisance on KD, which not very many players in the league can do. Like there was a early fourth quarter possession on the right wing where Kevin Durant had PJ Washington in an ISO and he tried a jab step jumper and KD had a bad miss. It was far to the right and he hit it off the heel of the rim and it went over the back of the rim. And if you watch the play, like PJ Washington's just sitting in defense and he's kind of like not conceding the jab step jumper, but there's a reason why KD took it. Like he had the space to do it, but PJ was able to close and get a really good contest because he had the length there. And if you look at Dallas's perimeter defenders before that trade, 
They got guys with length. They got guys that can guard on the perimeter, but they didn't. Ha- their length was like a skinnier, shorter guy in Derek Jones Jr. Right or a fire hydrant guy in in Josh Green. PJ Washington brings like actual size to that position defensively that they didn't have before, which I thought was really interesting. But it extends down the roster because Derek Jones Jr. is a very good defensive player. I thought he had some really good defensive possessions on KD as well. He actually blocked him on a pull-up jumper in this game. How often do you see a perimeter defender block Kevin Durant on a jump shot, right? And then Josh Green just kind of brings a different kind of uh, of athlete to the table. Like I said, Josh Green's more of like that shorter, stockier fire hydrant type of defender that can beat people to spots and bring kind of like a physical strength to the position, right? Derek Jones Jr. is like freaky athleticism and length, right? And then PJ Washington's more of like your stereotypical traditional big forward that can guard on the perimeter. So they have different types of players that they can bring in that situation, which allows them to give different looks on the ball. So they can actually make sure that they have multiple perimeter defenders to throw at multiple different perimeter options for the other team. And again, like that matters because you're going to get cooked sometimes, but more often than not, if you make a a superstar work harder, you can kind of limit his effectiveness enough to give yourself a better chance to succeed. There are going to be guys, the top tier guys that can cook you even when you play perfect defense. But more often than not, you're going to get a better result when you have better perimeter defense personnel that can make the other star work harder over the course of the 48 minutes. We talked about this last night with Austin Reeves. I was talking about like uh, all of you guys who play basketball who are ball handlers. When you walk onto the court, when your local pickup run or your local men's league, or even when you're if you're playing in college, when you go to practice, when one of your teammates is on you and you're like, oh yeah, this dude has no chance to guard me. He doesn't have the physical tools. I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm faster, whatever it is. You, you have that tool. You From the beginning of the game, you just know, I'm going to be comfortable against this guy. I'm going to get to my spots. Whereas we all know that guy. We all have a guy where like, when he steps on the floor and you gar- guards you, you're like, well, this is going to be a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, and it's like, you can still have some success, but you're going to have to work harder to do so. And like, Dallas just has more guys now, an additional guy in the form of, PJ Washington, that gives them another option to make opposing stars feel uncomfortable, which I think is valuable. And again, all three of them can help on the offensive end of the floor. Josh Green has shot the ball really well the last two years. Like, this was a guy that you could leave open in the playoff run in 2022. And like, the last two years, he's been a dead eye spot up shooter, which is a testament to how hard he's worked and has made him a much more useful player for them, especially as a 3 and D guy. Derek Jones Jr. is really, he's not as as accurate of a shooter as a guy like Josh Green, but he's actually a more efficient spot-up player. One of the main reasons why is he's really good at that slashing cut off of, or slashing drive off of the wing. Uh, There was actually a play like this in the first half of this game. Luka's working, it was either ISO or a post-up on the left elbow extended, and uh, Derrick Jones Jr.'s guy digs down to the elbow. And when the off-ball defender digs down to the elbow, there's a baked-in driving lane. It's baked into the coverage. Because if you throw a quick swing pass and you quickly rip to the right, that defensive player is not in position to beat you to the spot. And if he does, he's not going to be able to slide. He's going to have to turn and run, in which case you can make a counter move towards the middle and easily cross him over and get back into the lane. And Derek is really good at reading those driving lanes and attacking quickly off the catch and getting to the basket in a spot-up situation. Again, this is something I talk about all the time on this show. Three-point shooting is only one part of being an effective off-ball weapon. Having the ability to cut without the basketball, be an offensive rebounder, and then also driving closeouts. Those are ways to be effective spot-up players. Derrick Jones Jr. has been, I think he's like 1.09 points per spot-up possession this year. That's above average. That's That's a plus offensive player that you have there. And then P.J. Washington, he's a solid shooter when he's wide open. He was 39% on unguarded jumpers when he was in Charlotte. That's a field goal percentage, so weighted for threes, obviously considerably higher. I could live without the random transition pull-up threes that he took in this game. I think he was one for two, but I, I just don't necessarily think that needs to be in his game right now. But he can do the slot drive thing as well. He had a big one in the fourth quarter coming off of the right wing where he got to his left hand. He had a couple others in the game. He's also good at identifying when he has a mismatch. P.J. Washington will... Like find uh, like whether it's through a switch or a scramble situation, he'll find a guard on him, and rather than just going to stand in the corner, he will duck down into the lane and create a good passing angle. And you can throw a pass over the top. The uh, Mavs have good, uh, you know, uh, uh, post entry passers catches the ball, and he'll just rise up and dunk. And he's already had a few of those with Dallas where he can get a deep seal and score in there. But the point is, Dallas now has a pretty deep and solid two way perimeter defender core. 
at different position groups too, right? Like PJ Washington brings it more as a forward and Derek Jones Jr. is kind of more of a wing and Josh Green can bring it more as a guard, but like they, they just have like a lot more options there than they did before the trade. The next layer of Dallas's defense is their back line. The addition of Daniel Gafford gives them two really good athletes at the center position. I like that they started Derek Lively. I, I mean, at least to this point, I think Derek Lively's playing a little bit better. I think you see that in the plus minus numbers too. Ironically, he could be their best option, which is crazy for a rookie, right? And, and it just goes to show you how one, you know, really smart draft pick can change the uh, uh, fortunes of a franchise, right? But between Daniel Gafford and Derek Lively and also Maxi Kleba and his ability to defend in switches like he did against Kevin Durant, they have a pretty athletic and versatile front line. But the big thing I'm going to be keeping an eye on moving forward is the rebounding piece. So in the four games since Daniel Gafford joined the team, they have a 72.7 defensive rebound percentage. That's considerably higher than where they were before that stretch. As a team before that stretch, 69.4%. So again, small sample size, but I want to keep an eye on it because having just some more athletes and also healthy, being healthy, I think has helped. Uh, but I'm just curious to see if they can rebound better over the course of the end of the season because that was a big problem for them early in the season. And then uh, uh, two other pieces on the defensive end. They rotate really well. How many times did you see in that game? We talked about that one possession with the double team of Kevin Durant where they didn't leave any openings. And if you watch the other three guys, they're constantly positioning themselves kind of splitting the difference between options, making it so that whichever guy they pass to, they can rotate to, right? But how many times in this game did you see a, a trap or a double team of Devin Booker or Kevin Durant coming off of a ball screen and then a scramble situation where they Phoenix moves the ball around and they get the ball to like Yusuf Nurkic in the post or something like that. But by the time they get it there, there's already a defender who has rotated back and is positioned behind Yusuf Nurkic and the advantage is gone. Or it gets worked around to an open Eric Gordon on the weak side, but they're able to chase Eric Gordon off the line. And now that buys you the time to make another rotation. Really sharp rotations are especially important, important for teams like Dallas that have good defensive personnel, but not like outstanding defensive personnel. A team like Dallas that's going to have have in all likelihood two uh two or three depending on the the lineup kind of iffy defensive players on the floor defensive rotations are going to be a key part of their success and they were really really sharp against Dallas and then lastly you need Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic to at least put in the effort and to do their jobs which is what they are doing and that's the formula for them incredible offense with playoff resiliency that you get from Luka and Kyrie and then two-way athletes around them that can finish plays and do the dirty work. I thought it was a really impressive first showing in a quality matchup for Dallas with their new additions. They are heading out on a four-game road trip now. They're at Indiana, at Cleveland, at Toronto, and at Boston over the course of the next week or so. So we're going to learn a lot about Dallas over that stretch. All right, Phoenix looked like so many games from earlier in the season when Beal was hurt. They start out hot. And then teams start bringing super aggressive coverages in that late third quarter, fourth quarter stretch on Kevin Durant and Devin Booker, just double teaming them. And then their offense falls apart and it trickles down into every area of the game. Then they start to not rebound as well. Then they start to not defend as well. And that's why they've been so mediocre without Bradley Beal on the floor this year. Uh, handling double teams is the big thing that stands out when Beal is off the floor. When Beal is out there, they usually only have one or maybe even zero negative offensive players on the floor. And so they can really quickly operate out of those aggressive coverages. But when Beal is not out there, all of a sudden it's like at least one limited offensive player on the floor, if not two. And that's how you end up with that early fourth quarter stretch when Dallas blew the game open. Josh Okoji and Nasir Little were both on the floor together. They were getting in each other's way in the middle of the floor because both of them kind of wanted to short roll into that area as a result or, or roll or cut into that area because they know they have limitations as shooters. They kept ending up above the break too, like multiple times for both of them. And they're just bad above the break shooters. I think Koji's like 29%. And I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Nasir Little's like 31% above the break. So like they're guys that you just don't have to go guard out there. That's below a point per shot. And so that lineup just... Again, like I said earlier, just dips below a certain like mandatory minimum amount of offensive talent to be able to deal with the aggressive coverages that Kevin Durant and Devin Booker get. And then the other part of it is I think they can get a little stagnant in terms of their off-ball player movement. Like that play that I, I talked about, and I clipped this play. It's on my Twitter feed at underscore Jason LT that you guys can find. But the uh, double team that led to the use of, or the Josh Koji turnover, which led to the Kyrie Irving nasty spinning layup the other end of the floor. Watch Grayson Allen in the left corner. He doesn't move. 
And like, again, when everyone on the floor is a laser from three with some of their better lineups, you can get away with standing still because ball movement and red hot shooting will get you through that moment. But when the lineup offensive talent just kind of dips below that level, I think they do need to be more creative to make themselves harder to guard. There needs to be more player movement. You need to have Grayson Allen at a, at a position where he's closer to the basketball so that he can help be a release valve in those situations. I think they just have to do a better job of making themselves harder to guard in those situations. But big shock, they need Bradley Beal to win. That's not a, a criticism of Phoenix. That's the same for every single team in the league that uh, that has a real shot to win the title. Uh, you know, not even just stars, even extending down to role players. Like you need an injury to a significant rotation piece is going to make it significantly harder for any of these teams to win and certainly is the case with Bradley Beal. Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get a no sweat bet up to $1,000 back in a bonus bet. I was looking at NBA futures this morning. The Golden State Warriors are plus 5,500 right now on DraftKings to win the title. So if you believe in them, that's a big number. And Denver, I have Denver as my championship favorite, and they're still the second best odds on DraftKings right now at plus 450. So lots of good NBA bets to look at over the course of the end of the season. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. The crown is yours. You'll know real when you get it. It'll say eBay Authenticity Guarantee, and you'll feel it. Because when it comes to your feet, eBay has your back. Maybe it's a head-turning pair for hooping or a hot new collab. Whatever you're after, when you cop on eBay, you can trust that your kicks will be checked by experts. Not just any experts, sneaker experts who live and breathe the culture. Real people with real hands-on authentication experience. That's what the blue check mark represents on our listings. eBay authenticity guarantee, meaning every inch, stitch, sole, and logo is verified authentic through a detailed inspection. So when you finally step into those grail kicks, you'll realize that the feeling is unlike any other. And with eBay's authenticity guarantee, that feeling of real is always within reach. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal. Visit ebay.com for terms. Celtics Bulls. So I talked about, uh, you know, last week, the idea of the Celtics having so much margin for error and being able to try stuff, right? Because they're, they're going into last night, they were, what, six games up on the two seed in the East and then four games up on the one seed in the West. So they just have a comfortable margin to work with, right? And they also have a super easy schedule down the stretch of the season. Well, you saw that a little bit in the first half. Like they straight up ran five possessions of that 3-2 zone that they've been working on as of late and they got cooked in it. I think they gave up nine points in the five possessions of the 3-2 zone. Chicago got in a rhythm. They had 39 points in the second quarter. Uh, Kobe White made like a drifting three on a, a kind of a, a breakdown defensive rotation situation where he had a drifting three on the left wing, put him up by three, 62-59 going into the half. But in the second half, Boston tightened the screws in their man-to-man defense for one quarter, and the game was over. And again, that's the flexibility that they have with their talent and with the margin that they have in the standings. And they were really sharp in their extra efforts on defense. They had several blocks at the rim. The Celtics had 11 blocks in this game. As a matter of fact, they're second in the league in blocks. Just so many athletes. There was this play, uh, uh, Alex Caruso got a steal and threw like a two-handed overhead bounce pass that hit, I think it was Ayo Desunmu in transition. And he was ahead of the field. But Jalen Brown and Derek White were trailing the play. And I remember as I'm watching it, and I don't even know what's going to happen yet. I'm like, this is a bad idea. <laughs> like, you might as well pull this one out. And like Derek White and Jalen Brown both just sky way above the rim and block the Sunmu at the rim. Also, the uh, Celtics broadcasters were talking about Vucevic and how he was kind of killing them in the first half. And I think it was Scalabrini mentioned like they have to do a better job on Vucevic's rolls to the rim of digging down and making it harder for him to catch there or harder for him to elevate when he gets there. And they were just doing a better job when Vucevic caught there in the second half of digging down from the weak side and disrupting the basketball. Drew Holiday had to dig down from the left wing where he actually knocked the ball loose and caused a turnover. They just did a much better job defensively. And then again, helping off of iffy shooters. The Bulls are 24th and three-pointers made per game. So that's the team that you want to pack the paint on. They got it going uh, on the defensive end, which led to... Uh, success on the offensive end as well. And then they pulled away in that third quarter. Obnoxiously good jump shooting in this game. 
the Celtics made 19 pull-up jump shots. They scored 50 points on 34 attempts. Comes out to 1.47 points per shot. Think about how insane that is in pull-up jump shooting. Anything over one point is good. The Celtics average slightly over one point in uh, in pull-up jump shot situations. But like again, pull-up jumpers are... Uh, the reason why just barely over one point is good there when like a 120 offensive rating is more like what you want in a grand scheme of a game. Most of the time, pull-up jump shooters are like coverage beaters or rescue possession type situations. The Celtics actually can lean on them in high doses in nights like this when they're making them at such an insane clip. Jalen Brown was just insanely hot in the first half. The Celtics were running horn sets where they have two players at the elbow, two players in the deep corner player up top. They were running horn sets to get Jalen Brown with uh, Nikola Vucevic switched onto him. And then he would just beat Nikola Vucevic with like a hard downhill move into like a step back three. He also hit like a left shoulder fade over Alex Caruso out of the post. We're going to talk some more about that here in a minute, but he had a really, really nice stretch in that first half. He had 20 points to kind of keep them in the game while their defense wasn't as locked in. And then in that third quarter run, Jason Tatum and Derek White got their pull-up jump shots going. Hauser ended up hitting a big three in transition on the left wing. All of a sudden, they're up 14, and they never looked back. Really sharp performance to start the Celtics season out of the break. I wanted to... I'm going to stay on Boston for a minute because I wanted to clarify some comments that I made earlier about Boston's lack of an interior attack. This is something I've been talking a lot about. I've been harping a lot on Boston's offense because I think it's the main thing that is going to be the de- uh, the determining factor of their success in the postseason. And Boston is an elite offense, elite of the elite, but they've been elite in the large sample. They have also had a a tendency to go really cold in individual games, especially in high profile games, and their offense has fallen apart in those situations. And so I've been talking about them needing to have a counter, something that they can do that is more physically aggressive towards the rim when the jump shots aren't falling. I've had a lot of Celtics fans since I've been kind of getting on that wagon talking about how the Celtics are actually, they actually post up more than any team in the league. For the record, it's true. Boston posts up more than every team in the league except for Denver. Denver's the one team that posts up more than them. And they're the most efficient post up team in the NBA. Boston scores 1.15 points per post up, including passes. But all of their post up offense, including passes, only amounts to 12.8 points per game. Denver is also uh, Denver's also a really good post-up team, right? They're number one in post-up frequency, but they're also number two in points in the paint per 100 possessions. Boston is 27th in points in the paint per 100 possessions. Why? Because posting up is one of is only one way to get into the paint. There are many, many different ways to get the basketball into the paint, just like driving is only one way to get in the paint. Remember when all the talk was going on about the Lakers and their foul discrepancy and uh, and how they drive less than any team in the league? People, People think that driving is the only way to get in the paint. That's not how it works. The Lakers make the second most shots in the restricted area per game in the NBA. 56% of the Lakers shot attempts come within eight feet of the rim, despite the fact that they don't drive the basketball very much. Why is that? They are top 10 in points scored on cuts. Boston is 21st. They are first in two-point field goals made on rolls to the rim. Boston is 26th. Boston is mainly a pick-and-pop team. They take a lot of threes in pick-and-roll, right? Boston is 24th in field goals made on offensive rebound situations. Even in transition, Boston is second in transition threes made per game, but they are 17th in transition twos made per game. They run the floor for threes whereas the Lakers are third in transition twos scored per game. I'm not trying to compare the Lakers to the Celtics. Celtics are way better than the Lakers. They'd kick the shit out of them if they played in a series tomorrow. I'd pick them in four or five games. What I'm trying to make a point about is about the offensive versatility. Yes, the Celtics post up a lot, but they do not generate nearly enough points in the paint, which is a more resilient form of scoring than what happens when we get to the uh, the postseason. Again, like even if you look at their post-ups, they're a post-up team, that takes a lot of fadeaway jump shots out of the post. They had 18 post-ups versus Chicago last night. 11 of them either ended up in fadeaway jumpers or kick-out jump shots. Like they're, they post up for jump shots too, which is why their points in the paint are so limited. I'm not worried about it in the large sample. Boston, like to, to steal a word, a phrase from my friend Sam Vecini who came on the show last week, like they're ass kickers. They're total ass kickers on the offensive end of the floor. They are by far the best regular season team in the league. 
And I think they'd easily dispatch in the playoffs all but a small handful of teams. But we know one thing for sure. Boston can go cold. They went cold against Denver. They lost. They went cold against Milwaukee. They lost. They went cold against the Lakers. They lost. They went cold against the Clippers. They lost. It's not the large sample I'm worried about. It's the small sample size that I worry about for Boston. In the event that they find themselves in the Eastern Conference semis or Eastern Conference finals against Milwaukee or New York, and the series is tied at two, and game five is in Boston, and it's a super physical rock fight type of game, what happens if they go cold? What do they do next? Because we've seen in all those games I just mentioned, the Denver game, the Milwaukee game, and the two Lakers, the two LA teams, in those games, it wasn't like they were cold for a half and then they got hot. It was a consistent theme throughout the game. Even when they made a couple, they weren't able to sustain it. And a big part of that is that's just how these types of games go. This has been an overarching theme of my kind of basketball philosophy for a long time. The more important the basketball game is, the more physical it becomes, the more intense it becomes, and the more the skill-oriented parts of the game become difficult. Which is why I am so you know, high on teams that have interior physicality. Just go back through NBA history. Like last year's Denver Nuggets team. Biggest, strongest player on the floor, Nikola Jokic. Now, the Warriors in 2022... It's Steph Curry. He's the greatest small perimeter player in the history of basketball. So he's the exception that proves the rule. You can't use him as, a, as evidence of what you can do. Nobody on Boston is even remotely in the same stratosphere as a shooter as Steph Curry. So that, that, that can't be your approach, right? 2021, Giannis Antetokounmpo, biggest, strongest player on the floor most of the time. 2020, LeBron James and Anthony Davis, big, massive, physically imposing front line. 2019, Kawhi Leonard, big, massive, physically imposing forward. Like that is the way you win. Most of the time. And again, I, like I was literally, I, you guys know I coach high school basketball here in town. I was watching our kids play in a playoff game on Wednesday and uh, um, they ended up, they were up by one with less than a minute left. And then uh, the other team made a couple of plays. They ended up winning by four and their season's over now. Um, but in the game, it was interesting because I, once again, watching the game, super, super intense. Both teams season on the line. Both teams bringing crazy, crazy level of effort on both ends of the floor. You know what wasn't happening? A ton of three-point shots. And that's not to say that that's not an important part of the game. Of course, it's an important part of the game. And before you say, this is how we've been playing and it's been working, that's not the case. In 2022, when the Celtics made it to the NBA Finals and got within two wins of hoisting the trophy, they were eighth in three-point attempts per 100 possessions, not first. They were 15th in points in the paint per 100 possessions, not 27th. They were a much more balanced scoring team in that 2022 season than they were now. They have gone so, so, so far in that direction to the point where now they've attached their fate to variance. Last night in Chicago, they scored 129 points. Only 30 of them were in the paint. They attempted 57 jump shots in that game. Again, it's not about Chicago. It, 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 like It's not about the 82 game regular season. This is 100% about a seven-gamer against a healthy Knicks team, against a healthy Bucks team, against a healthy Nuggets team, or a healthy Clippers team. That's the lens that we have to look through. The, uh, the look through. By the way, I have Celtics second as my list of championship contenders. I think they're the most talented team in the league. Why I'm harping on this is this is going to make or break their season, in my opinion. There is a chance that they just go into the playoffs and they make their threes five to six times per series and they just beat the shit out of everybody. That's a chance. I'm not trying to say that that's not possible. Of course that's possible. But winning an NBA championship is hard. Winning four series in two months is hard. And they have made themselves beatable in the sense that if you can play them into their worst tendencies and they go and you play a super physical brand of basketball, you can get them to go cold and you might be able to steal the series from them. If Boston loses, that's what it will look like. A way to prevent that from happening is to be more active in those specific areas. Run in transition for layups and dunks whenever you can. Take the threes when they're an option. Stop running for the purpose of taking threes. Roll to the basket harder more. Jalen Brown, Drew Holiday, and Jason Tatum. When you're posting up, stop settling for fadeaways every damn... Like, Jalen Brown is the best fadeaway jump shooter in the league this year. Outstanding athlete. He can go over both shoulders... Excellent fadeaway jump shooter. 
even the best fadeaway jump shooter in the world is not close to as efficient on that shot as Nikola Jokic is on a hook in the lane. Forget about that. It's not even close to as efficient as Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum can be in physical bully ball post-up possessions. So like crashing the offensive glass more, running for tra in transition for layups and dunks, posting up with physicality towards the rim instead of finesse away from the rim, rolling to the basket more in pick and roll situations that like th th those are all like cuts to the basket off the ball instead of constantly spotting up, maybe taking advantage of a defender being out of position by cutting to the basket. These are all ways that Boston can add points in the paint to make their scoring more resilient. That 2022 Boston team, that's a great mark to be. Eighth in three-point attempts per 100 possessions, 15th in points in the paint. That is an analytically sound approach. You are taking advantage of high-value shots on the floor while making sure that you have some more resiliency when the shots aren't falling. Boston was able to win ugly better in that season than they were this season. And again, I don't want this to come off as... Celtics criticism. That's not that's not what I'm trying to do. We're nitpicking here because we're talking about the very best of the best. Like, if I wanted to talk about the Lakers, I'd have to get into 17 other massive issues before they'd even have a chance to be in these conversations, right? Boston has everything else checked. If they can figure this out, they will hoist the trophy. That is why I'm viewing this as such an important swing factor for them this season. All right, before we get out of here, I want to talk about J.J. Redick and the state of sports media. So the backstory here, for those of you guys who missed it, uh, J.J. Redick criticized Doc Rivers on, I think, Monday or Tuesday because Doc won't stop criticizing his players even though he's got his own set of issues. I didn't have any problem with that cr criticism. Honestly, it's like nice to see players be authentic, honestly, because like so many former players get out and they uh, you know, are, are just always on the defensive uh, of NBA players or NBA coaches, and they kind of just take the company line on everything. And so I appreciated the authenticity in that situation, right? But then JJ came on the next day on first take, and he talks about how fans don't want to be educated about basketball. And he provided an example, and he basically said, I did a deep dive on Zion Williamson and him being on the ball more. Those of you guys who listen to this show, we did a similar conversation, not as deep, but we had a conversation about Pelican, the Pelicans and Zion playing better, being on the ball more, and generating closeout opportunities for the Pelicans off-ball players or perimeter players and how they've been really killing teams with that. JJ did a far more in-depth version of that where he talked about specific actions that the Pelicans are using, namely empty corner pick and rolls with Jonas Valanciunas and just in general, like transition pushes and sweeping drives from uh, Zion. Ghost screens, too, with guys like Trey Murphy and stuff like that. Really, really well done by J.J. Redick. I, I want to be clear. This is my disclaimer. I think J.J. Redick is the very best in the world at what he does. He's someone that I look up to a lot. Someone I strive to be like. He's a hard worker. He's super knowledgeable. He's an excellent communicator. He brings that former NBA player perspective. He's awesome with interviews, color commentary, studio shows, everything. I think he's the best. But I disagree with his take about the current state of sports media. So I wanted to talk about it for a second. First of all, I am super optimistic about the current state of sports media. The ecosystem and the tools that we have at our disposal are incredible. You can, these days, if you have a MacBook and an iPhone, due to, I think it's called like, I can't remember what the technology is called from Apple, but you can actually use your iPhone as a webcam now. That's what I do when I travel. When I go on ski trips with my wife or whatever the hell I'm doing, I set up my phone and I can make a high quality video on the road with a little handheld microphone that I got on Amazon that I think was like 20, 30 bucks a, a long time ago. Like, and I got that one before I even started working with the volume. Like, it is easy to come up with the equipment to make quality content now. In addition to that, you can distribute it extremely easily between free tools like YouTube, social media, and the algorithms that are behind that. The algorithms that promote content based on watch time. As a result, we have a ton of options. We have incredible team-specific pods, national pods, draft guys, film guys, CBA guys, like you name it. We have everything under the sun now. Like If you go back like 10 years... Think about the kind of niche basketball analysis that was available five, 10 years ago versus now. It is skyrocketing. I, I am so optimistic about the state of sports media. But the take JJ had, he said, when I made that Zion Williamson video, it only got 54,000 views. When I criticized my former head coach, it went viral and had tens of millions 
of impressions. This is where I think we have to be realistic. I think it's unrealistic to expect a ton of engagement from niche content like that, like the Zion video. Like a guy like me is going to be super interested in a video like that. All of you guys who listen to the show, you're going to be super interested in something like that. But there's no doubt that like, like shorter attention span type of content that sort of thing is going to perform better in the masses, like lower brow or low brow is probably the, not the way to phrase it, but like more surface level content is easier to digest by the masses. It's no different than like, if I was talking to my wife about the grateful Dead, and she's like, I like Scarlet Begonias. That's a cool song. And then I was like, well, let me talk to you about the chord progression of this song. And then the differences between, you know, this tour versus last tour and the tone that John Mayer was using and the kind of like vibe that he's going with, with the way he's playing over it. And like the way that they use Jeff Cimenti as the piano player in Franklin's tower now versus like, I can get into the weeds about that shit. Carly's not going to care. Why would she? She just doesn't care about that. Right? Like there's different levels of interest in this kind of thing. There are basketball fans that get invested in the playoffs and will turn on a broadcast and they'll watch superstars play. And then there are basketball fans that want to get in the weeds. And so to me, like, I don't necessarily understand the, the comparison there. Like JJ Reddick criticizing his coach on first take or uh, um, I don't even remember which platform he originally did it on, but that being talked about is going to be a significantly larger you know, audience that's going to be interested in it. Like I could get Let's invent a fictitious person that's the very best basketball analysis uh, analyst in the history of mankind and give him all of the top of the line, you know, production tools that are available to him and give him, you know, the world's biggest YouTube channel to post it on. Post it on freaking, I don't know what, Mr. Beast's channel or something like that and pretend all of them are basketball or people that are interested in sports in some way, shape or form. If he did the Zion Williamson video and posted it there, it's not going to perform as well as some surface level content. That's just the reality. So that is where I think we have to be more realistic. That doesn't mean we can't be better. And I do think that what JJ is getting at in the big picture is important. I think specifically game broadcasts, we can get so much better. It's so much more important for the color commentators that are on those broadcasts to be able to actually explain to fans what are happening on the court. JJ Reddick does a great job of this. Stan Van Gundy does a great job of this. Even local guys, like one of my favorites on League Pass is Antonio Daniels, who covers the Pelicans. I think he does a, such a good job of breaking down some of the X's and O's stuff that is happening on the floor. But why do I care about broadcasts? Because broadcasts are where we go to get the games. Everything else, it's you can go where you want. Like, I never have understood people who complain about first take and it being like surface level. Why are you watching it then? Like, who's making you turn on ESPN? I, I, I haven't watched live first take in, I, don't, I, I think it's been 10 years. I'm not interested in it. So when I want to watch a piece of sports media content, I personally like in-depth basketball analysis. I like to learn from in-depth. I, I like to learn from other basketball minds. And so I will try to find a team-specific pod or a national pod that I like. And I'll find a guy that, whose opinion and basketball intellect I respect, and I will listen to that person. If you're choosing to listen to ESPN and you don't like ESPN, that's a you problem. But game broadcasts, they're where we go to watch the NBA. That's where I think we need to do better. More guys doing color commentary like the guys I mentioned that primarily focus on explaining to fans what is happening on the, uh, on the court. A big one to me too is studio shows, pregame. Halftime, post-game shows. I'd love to see better panelists that do a better job of explaining the X's and O's to the fans that uh, uh, um, that are watching the games. Way too often, between color commentary and studio shows, we get surface level analysis. You know, uh, like, and, and here's the thing: shows like Inside the NBA, they're legendary in the in the industry. That's a huge part of me growing up as a basketball fan. But like, yeah, it's not exactly the most tactically proficient show out there, right? And I think it would be beneficial for basketball fandom or whatever you want to call it to have better, you know, uh, better game breakdowns and explanations of the tactics in those settings because I can, I think we can make smarter casual fans that way. But like, again, like to me, I don't understand how like, like first take 
it, to me has nothing to do with the realm of basketball analysis. It's just, it's there for their audience. My show's here for my audience. JJ's, show's, JJ's show is there for his audience. You can go where you want to go. That, 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 there's, no re- there's no reason to watch a show that you don't want to watch anymore. And then again, at the end here, viewership tells us that there are topics that have large audiences and there are topics that have smaller audiences. At the end of the day, this is a business. I talk about this on my show. It's a big part of how this show is structured. I'll get in the weeds, but you bet your ass if there's a LeBron topic, I'm going to hit it. You bet your ass if there's a Steph topic, I'm going to hit it. You bet your ass I'm going to cover the major pro, uh, 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 the major markets. Why? Because I'm competitive and I want to win. I want this show to be the best. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I do both. If I bring the in-depth new stuff and I make sure that I hit bigger picture topics. And I don't think it's fair or realistic to pretend like we're above the bigger picture topics. When I, even I still remember even when I was younger when I was playing basketball in college, like after practice, before practice, on the bus, you, you don't think we're having first take style debates about LeBron versus MJ or stuff like that. That's also an important part of the sports media space. That's never going away. Will it shift a little bit? Will debate shows get a little smaller or maybe a little bigger? Who knows? Like, yeah, there will be shifts, but there's always going to be a spot in sports media for that kind of thing. That's a, an important part of the business. And I'm thankful that we have a format here where we can do both. No one's stopping me from spending 15 minutes talking about this because I have the freedom to do so thanks to this new ecosystem. 15 years ago, if I happen to be working at a television company, I'd have timelines and I have to be out by this commercial break. And like you bet, like I, I might only have 30 minutes in a show or one hour in a show minus commercial time to figure out how to fit everything. And I might have to be way more picky and I might have to focus on some of the, No, I don't have that problem anymore. If I want to tell Paul's our lead producer now, if I wanted to t- tell him on Sunday, like I want to do 20 minutes on, you know, some random college basketball game, they're not going to stop me from doing that. I can do that now. That's a beautiful part of the way the sports media space has changed. I think it's better than ever. I'm super, super optimistic about it. And I don't have any problem at all with folks who make a living on more of the surface level stuff. It's an important part of the space. If they can retain an audience and make money on it, good for them. I don't have any problem with that. And I think a lot of those people are are super, 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 super talented. Guys like Stephen A. Smith, guys like Shannon Sharp, they are incredible talents. And like, and and I, and I and I don't believe in minimizing that necessarily. Here's the bottom line: I think JJ is very good for sports media uh, and basketball media in general, and I think he is one of the guys that's going to help address some of those problems that I talked about earlier. But debate shows and surface level content they have a place too. You can choose what you want to watch, and this is where like Nick Wright, Nick Wright kind of went after JJ on Twitter. And was ta- and kind of pointing out some of the uh, some similar things to what I was talking about. And one of the things he said that I thought was was a good point is he goes, "Why would you go on first take, take the check, like take the payment, agree to be on the show, and then be critical of the show?" That I don't understand because, like, that's literally what that space is. Nobody turns on first take expecting Zion Williamson film breakdowns. That's an unrealistic expectation, right? And so I, I I guess like what I'm trying to say is like, I'm a big believer in like the core belief system that's driving JJ in this endeavor. I just don't necessarily think it has anything to do with first take at all whatsoever. To me, like JJ has an opportunity to improve some specific areas of basketball media for the better. And I think those conversations are worth having, but I'm not a big believer in being critical of people who just do a different kind of sports media because that's what they do. They're just a different kind of sports media. I remember a while back, this is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll get out of here. I was uh, talking about a a fan base, and this was years ago. This was like, I want to say like 2018. It was well before I was even doing podcasts. And um, I was was, uh, uh, being critical of some fan, I think, and then Samus Fondiari, who's become a friend of mine, pointed out about how pointless it is to be fan police. Because why would I think that like my version of being a sports fan is the right way to be a sports fan? It's just not. 
that, that that's ridiculous. There's so many different ways to be a sports fan. You can be passionate. You can be vocal. You can be quiet. You can be uh, a content creator. You can be a content c- consumer. There's like a million different ways to be a fan. Why would I act like my way is the only way to do it or that there's a wrong way to be a fan? The only wrong way to be a fan is to be violent or abusive, right? Like that stupid couple who called KD a bitch and then tried to be nice to his face right after. Like, I have no respect for that shit. But like, there is no wrong way to be a fan. But I feel the same way about sports media and media in general. I don't want to play media police. There's not a right or wrong way to do it. This ecosystem allows everybody to do it their own way. It's been so good for the space. We have so much better content as a result. I'm a huge fan of the direction we're going. And as I said, I am an optimist about where we're headed. All right, I'm off my soapbox. I appreciate you guys for listening to the show. The game plan for this weekend, we are taking tomorrow off, but I'm going to be uploading a video after the Sunday afternoon game, which I think is Lakers Suns, if I remember correctly. And then the Sunday evening game, I believe is uh, Nuggets Warriors. That one we're going live on YouTube after. So two shows on Sunday, no show on Saturday. I will see you guys on Sunday.